Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Good morning, lads. Good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, Norm and I spent yesterday in Los Angeles. Yeah. Wow, I'm sorry. Uh, no, <laughs> Los Angeles is a great like, city. I, like I, I accept city. your apology. Do you know I'll always say that? No, I, I love LA. I, I, I used to do it just to bait you, but now, <laughs> like, having spent a lot more time there over the last few years, yeah. it's awesome. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a much more livable city for me as a mid-40s creative type than it was as a mid-20s creative type. Oh, that type. checks out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, th there's a rivalry between San Francisco and Los Angeles that San Francisco feels very strongly about, and I don't think Los Angeles really knows about. <laughs> Look, I, I can hate the Dodgers and love Los Angeles. Sure, totally. I just don't like the traffic. The traffic is boring, especially when you've got to go over the hill and stuff like that. Um, but well, I flew back. back last night, but you drove back I, last I, night. I gave you the, uh, the opening you're gonna there. Give, you could have ridden with Norm, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, I, the I option was presented. The, the option was presented, but I had to wait for him to both drop Joey off and charge his Tesla. Well, that does happen. Yeah, no, I recognize that. Yeah. It just didn't want it to happen to me. No. I managed to catch a 6 p.m. flight. I was home by 7.30. Oh, what, great. what did it Goodness. cost you to drive <laughs> back from Los Angeles? Uh, $14. Wow. Yeah, that's that's real. Wow. Yeah. But it took, you know, seven and a half hours. Okay, so $14 <clears> plus... You plus know. time. Yeah, you're... Plus yeah. Your, getting getting home at 2 a.m. was pretty... It's pretty not good. But I, I tweeted the picture. Oh, yeah. People so the reason we were there, yeah, uh, we were hanging out with our old friend Frank Ippolito. Mm -hmm. And it this was time after three years to finally that. start. That was three years ago? Yeah. To finally start finishing the Martian suit. Resume the Martian suit. <laughs> Frank himself has been through, I think, two and a half shop shop space yes it's, yes when we first uh, shot it we were in his first tiny little shop and now he's in this like much bigger building mm -hmm. the, the last time i went to visit him i actually rolled in and i pulled up to the one of the old shops and i was like hey i'm banging on the door nobody's here and texted him and he was he was like hey, uh where are you nobody's banging <laughs> on the door and then i had to drive someplace else so that was great well, it was awesome. It was great to, uh, he, you know, Frank, his, his shop is very busy. He's got a whole bunch of employees working full time. He's been working on a bunch of really cool projects. Uh, and the Martian is a, ex there are hundreds of pieces to this costume. Yep. yep. Okay, let's say dozens and dozens. And every one is like a custom part that needs to get finished, painted. There are extended. hundreds of processes and yeah. steps yeah. to get to a um, suit. And he's been chipping away at it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the suit is made out of spray polyurea, a uh, spray truck bed liner. Oh, and wow. there's actually turnkey services that now do this in L.A. So, you know, Frank's shop, they, they've they really done the bulk of all the work on this. Uh, they they sculpted some of the parts. They had them mold. They had open molds made and had them sprayed. So most of the pieces are there. It's now time for us to just start sanding and finishing and me mechanizing and painting. Yeah. Awesome. It, it, it's like this is no easy feat. And... <laughs> I think when we started it three years ago, there was a thinking of, well, we could approach this as what um, cost, from the fan perspective and what, what uh, cosplayers would do and maybe make some stuff out of foam. But I think what Frank wanted to do, because he was still s scaling up mm -hmm. and building out his business, he wanted to really use this as an exercise to do it exactly as FBFX would have done it with you know very close reference we yeah. had access to a suit and, and the effects uh, friends have mm -hmm. tested who actually built the martian suit they yeah. build all the space suits for all of ridley scott's films for the past few did years did they do the interstellar suits too or was that no that was somebody else that's um that's so, iron head isn't okay. it I, I don't think it was iron head but it's definitely some, someone else I, yeah. I, like right now i think of space suit design in films as either super small helmets like yeah. interstellar <laughs> yeah where i'm like i don't know how this doesn't fog up the whole time but okay or, or giant giant prometheus slash yeah. martian yeah. slash whatever bubble dome Exactly. So the way Frank and his team are going about making this stuff, from the soft parts to the hard parts to the, the hardware, <coughs> is really as true to the original. So he's, he's making dog food. He's, yeah, it's it's. Yeah. So it, there's some parts are sculpted and then molded. Some parts are 3D printed. The helmets they did an entire, extensive, an amazing drawing. The whole helmet printed in one piece. It took like wow, eighty hours. Yeah. Well, I saw you had all those 3D printers down there. So now I guess yeah. I know why. Um, and then uh, when we wrapped, I had the choice to go with you, and I decided to go home. Sorry about that. I, that's okay. And I, 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 I I'm brought amazed your that parts. you're here this morning. Well, Norm's hard. Yeah. You no, know, he's hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> it's all it, it's all in preparation for the baby. You're gonna check out anyway. early. Yeah. No. 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 Well, you should. Yeah, you work, should totally work, this I'm, is I'm, this I'm, is not I'm, the week to do that. <laughs> 
So why? why oh my God! What's, what's going on? Is there anything well, happening? Yeah, Is and in like a week yes, and a half, we have New York Comic Con. That's right. Wait, what? Yeah, there's um, a Comic Con in New York. There is a Comic Con in New York. Wow. You're going to be in New York twice in two weeks. I know. Essentially. I know. I had I a lovely. I had a lovely breakfast the other day with Mr. John Hodgman, one of my favorite humans on the planet. Uh, dinner the night before with a bunch of my Nation of Makers board members, Ooh. my friend Adam Foss, John Scalzi, uh, Jen Schachter. It was awesome. Big meal. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, uh, I was in and out. I mean, for New York Comic Con, I think I was in for a total of 16 hours. Maker Fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What did Maker I say? Uh, Comic Con. You're right, there for right, Maker, right. Fair. Maker I mean, Fair. Yeah, for Maker New York, Fair. New York. I was in and out in a total of about 16 hours, but it still was uh, a fruitful was, visit. Was this your first time to New York Maker Fair? It was. I... So Norman and I have been I've been in three three or four times now, I think. Yeah. I love I love how different in tenor and tone New York Maker Fair is from Bay Area Maker Fair. Uh, and it's I totally agree with that. And by the same token, how uh, New York Comic Con is radically different from San Diego Comic Con. I mean, it's it's great to you know, to know a thing, right? Like we know the San Mateo Maker Fair really well. I know this that fair. Uh, the same way that I know San Diego Comic Con, and then you go to a place where it happens, and it's very culturally different, mm -hmm. is a real eye opener because it shows you just how how uh, how much more scope there can be to any given thing. It's right? geographically different. The, the layout of the you know the, the grounds mm -hmm. is different. It's a much bigger area because it's in uh, Flushing. It's where the World's Fair. Uh, the, was the back end in the, of Men in Black. Mm -hmm, that's right, uh, and uh, it's where Tony Stark's dad did a lot of work. Yeah, the, yeah, the Stark <laughs> Expo. The Stark Expo happened there way back in uh, fifty six. Uh, but <laughs> <clears throat> while like New York Comic Con and San Diego Comic Con are also widely different because they're just different organizations, yeah. Maker Fair thinks of these as different flagships. Mm -hmm, also, mm -hmm. New York is World Maker Fair, while the San Mateo one is the 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 home base, and one it's it's they curate different types of projects that are shown. Yeah. It's not. It's different. Different place. Different projects and different people. And so it's a whole different flavor. I think the first thing we said when we went to the World Maker Fair the first time was that there were way more robotic stuff. Mm -hmm. There was way, and that's that's shifted a little bit more uh, toward Bay Area in the six years, I guess, since we went to like World first Maker robotics, first time. huge presence. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but at like, New York. Well, kids robots, uh, teams from like Carnegie from the big East Coast technical Carnegie schools, Mellon and, Carnegie yeah, Mellon and yeah. MIT, and and all of that stuff, and. And like we were seeing a lot more like autonomous vehicles and stuff there the first time we went. That's again, that's kind of changed now because that's kind of spread out and gotten more accessible to everyone. But um, it's, it's really neat. And if you have an opportunity to go, I would highly recommend it. So the, the reason that I went was uh, Discovery flew me out to uh, be on stage with my six co-hosts of Mythbusters oh, nice. Jr. Yeah, all six kids. Uh, all six Mythbusters were there. And we did an appearance on stage and took questions from the audience, moderated by Jen Schachter oh, awesome. uh, of We the Builders and a uh, friend of Tested. She's fantastic and did a great job the best part about it <clears throat> was that all the audience questions were for the kids oh that's it's great so just look they, they've heard from you they enough. understood They're exactly good. yeah they knew why i was there they knew exactly what we were doing there and they had great questions and the mythbusters had wonderful answers it was really invigorating to see them get to experience a loving crowd like i was that. gonna say was this their first like I know they've been to like the upfronts and stuff like that. It was the TCAs, TCAs yeah. And yeah. when we did the TCAs, like <clears throat> as I said, I think on this podcast, the TCAs is a terrible audience. Not because they're bad people; they're just a bunch of working, working. reporters yeah. filing stories while you're talking. So they're not clapping, they're not laughing, they're not giving you any audience feedback. Even though, you know, that it, it, they're fine. Again, it's it's not like they're bad folks. That's what they're there for. Yeah, they're, they're there they're, to write and file stories. Thing. Yeah, but this was. Yeah, I think it was one of their, I think it was, might be the first time they were all together in front of a crowd wanting to hear about what they were really talking about just extemporaneously. That's awesome. Yeah. And then it was also awesome. You mentioned Jen Schachter was there. Uh, none of the core tested team here from San Francisco went out there, but a lot of our friends and people we've worked with were at New York Maker Daryl Fair. Maloney was also Darryl there. Daryl was he came there. came out to dinner as well. Uh, Laura Kampf was there. Oh, I Jen miss Sch Laura Kampf. Ah! Um, she uh, did a, a, a panel with uh, one of the, um, uh, the people who worked on Mythos Juniors, uh, Sophie uh, right. was Sophie there. Wong. Sophie yep. Wong. Um, uh, Melissa Ng was there. Yeah. Uh, I actually, after the fair, I made a stop in Queens nearby and visited Melissa Ng's shop. Oh, Melissa cool. Ng, if you don't know, is this incredible armor designer. Uh, and we are chatting right now about a collaboration, she and I, um, 
she's incredible. She is uh, not just an incredible aesthetic designer, but also an, a, a pretty amazing seat of the pants engineer. She's doing some pretty radical stuff in her shop, and I can't wait that uh, till we can cover she it in great She designs detail. and three prints armor. Yeah. Um, and wow. you may have seen like Felicia Day wearing some of her armor. Um, like super and, elaborate with like lots of open open forms that look very organic. It's very there's a lot of fantasy to it. It glows. A lot of her armor glows. Um, she's really really exploring, deeply exploring a bunch of different material science to get these things to both look correct, uh, function correctly, and also be comfortable to wear. What what does a queen's shop like a working shop look like in Queens? Well, th so that's actually something that I I, I don't want to talk about okay. because I think that uh, if we end up cover, you should take cameras there. Yeah, I, okay. it, it's actually pretty cool and pretty amazing the setup that that she has. And we'll I, have I, a chance I, to go back to New yeah, York to exactly. check it out. Maybe in like a week and a half. I was going to say one of the one of my favorite places that we visited when I was attested was uh, NYC Resistor, which was one of the first maker spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was one of the ones that some some friends were like. Man, I really want a laser cutter, but it's twenty five grand. What if we all put in like three grand and and you know we, yeah. we figure out how to slice share slice some time on it? But like as a space, it was in the attic of this old warehouse in Brooklyn, and it was just it, it kind of looked like your grandfather's basement in that it was just full of stuff. Oh, but great. it was twenty different people's worth of stuff, so yeah. there was like it, it was. It just felt really organic and neat. And it's the kind of place I could have spent three or four hours just walking around and asking, hey, what's this? Hey, what's this? Hey, what's Fantastic. This? And right. now five years later, I mean, as we've seen from Going to Maker Fairs, all that stuff is now brought into home garages yeah. you know, with home 3D printers and home laser cutters. Well, and the, the price has just been diving lower yeah. and lower. And, and accessibility and the tutorials and, and, and all the software. Uh, yeah. It was super inspiring. Super inspiring to see what was going on there. It's really cool. Um, so that was awesome. Uh, I was in uh, uh, Knoxville the day before. Oh, I lived in Knoxville for almost 10 years. I did a my appearance at UT for the incredible students there as okay. part of a thing called the Mossman Lectures, a mm -hmm. uh, part of an endowment given to UT that uh, that uh, part of an endowment devoted to science communicators and scientists coming and talking to kids. We had a capacity crowd and two overflow rooms filled with where, students. Where, where, where did you, where'd they have you talk? Do you remember? Was it like an auditorium? Yeah, it was a big auditorium. Okay. Big auditorium. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, it was great. Campuses. The students were great. But yeah, so in the last four days, I've been in three states. That's a I, I, I woke up in New York before leaving, before having to come back to, to, to L.A. Sorry. Yeah, I woke up in New York, <laughs> having to come back to L.A. And I'm lying there in my hotel room and <laughs> with my eyes closed. And I'm like, I have no idea what the shape of the room I'm in is. <gasps> right. Whoa, that's <laughs> like I'm not sure. Like with my eyes closed, I don't know where the window or the bathroom are. Hold on, let me open my. Whoa, that's not the room I expected to see. It's like it's too oh. many jumble. That's, that's so. Douglas <laughs> Adams always said that your soul only moves as fast. You can move your body as fast as you want, but your soul only moves at walking speed. Oh, fascinating. And that's what causes jet lag. Is your soul catching up with your body? <laughs> I forgot about that construction. Um, but yeah, I that like that 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 waking up and sitting there like getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom in the pitch black hotel room without my glasses on i have literally gotten up and turned right instead of left and walked into walls because i thought i was in the room yeah. for the day before yeah it's, um, it's rough. I, regularly uh this happens in the hotel in hotel rooms i will be reading something and they'll be funny and i'll reach over to tell my wife about them and she won't be oh. there <laughs> do you do you guys still sleep on the same side of the bed when you're in a hotel room, or do you sleep yes. like relative to the door, or relative to which side you normally sleep on? Relative to the side. Ah, so relative to the side. So like, you always sleep. I'm on the always left side on of the bed or the right side of the bed. A, the side that I'm on at home. Okay. Ah, so we are not. Uh, we find Julie and I that when we encounter a new hotel room, it's immediately apparent to both of us who should be on which side of the bed, and it's it's. It goes both ways. Sometimes I'm on the right. Sometimes I'm on the left. Oh. Is it, it because of the real, like space of where the desk is? And, uh, and it is. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Do you get the it's phone literally we both we both look side? at a we both look at a hotel bed and we both know how we want to what where, what side we want to lie on. So, and we never disagree. So Gina and I, I tend to be a door side, and Gina tends to be a window side. Yeah, she I tend to, to be a window. I tend to be a window side because um, she likes to have the window open, likes a little bit more air than I do. Mm -hmm. But she hurt her ankle a few weeks ago and has had like hasn't been able to keep it under the covers. 
And the side that it's on means that we've had to switch sides with the bed at home. Ah. Which has been... It was really discomforting. Like, we've lived in this <laughs> yeah, house for feels... 12 years. <laughs> yeah. I've slept on the same side of the bed every night for 12 years. Yeah. It's real weird, man. Yeah, so, that's yeah. a thing. That's yeah. so funny. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Norm here. Before we continue on with the show, I want to thank the sponsor that made this episode possible, and that is KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids that make learning about STEAM fun. Their mission is to provide the next generation of innovators with the tools and foundation to become creative problem solvers and critical thinkers. KiwiCo projects are designed to spark creativity, tinkering, and learning kids of all ages. And these projects are created by an in-house team of product designers and rigorously tested by kids. They have six types of projects for kids of all ages, from the Cricut Crate for toddlers to the Doodle Crate for teens. And it's really convenient. Every crate includes all the supplies needed for that month's project, easy to follow instructions, and an educational magazine to learn even more about that crate's theme. KiwiCo inspires kids to see themselves as makers, engineering, creating their own innovative designs and outcomes. Over this past summer, Danica and I have done a bunch of babysitting and kits like this really help pass the time and the kids really enjoy it. They're learning and having fun at the same time. It's a great way to keep kids' minds and hands busy. KiwiCo is offering listeners, you guys, of Still Entitled, the chance to try them for free. To redeem this offer and learn more about projects for kids, visit kiwico.com slash untitled. Now back to the show. Um, so what's, what's the plan for New York Comic Con? Where's your segue wow. for that, Chan? No, they got uh, nothing. New York Comic Con. I have a lot of work to do to get ready for it. I think we were a little shocked yesterday and we were like, oh, yeah, we're it's next thing is New York. And, and I'm gone all weekend, right? Oh, like, I'm actually doing an appearance at the Colorado School of Mines on Friday. Oh, man, that's a fun school. On Thursday. Oh, on Thursday. I, I wish and it was Friday, Mimes. I'm, what's that? I wish it was Mimes. <laughs> that's what my, Julie said the same thing. The Colorado School of Mimes? The Colorado School how of Mimes. Know, can't how will you know it. when they're applauding? <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday morning, everyone. <laughs> um, oh, so, boy. yeah, and then I'm in L.A. We're, uh, my wife and I are having a fundraiser uh, for our Children's Trust Ooh. on Saturday. Uh, our Children's Trust, do you know about this group? No. It's amazing. It's a, it's a group of kids who I are... I thought it was the trust for your children. I was like, no, that's no, a no, bit no. much, are, don't you think? <laughs> they are suing the U.S. government for not taking care of the environment. Oh. They consider it a constitutional duty of the government to maintain the space we live in for future generations. How can I help? Well, uh, I, I'll send you the download, the, okay. uh, the the donate link, and we can put it uh, in line after sure. this. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we've been supporting them for a long time. We've been we've been helping them out, and now we're throwing a fundraiser for them. So a couple of the plaintiffs will come. It's, it's, I'm really excited about That's it. That's awesome. That's that that is exactly the kind of thing that we need to be doing. Um, and, and this is this case has been winding through the courts for years. The Obama administration fought it for a long time. Uh, but uh, clearly, the Trump administration has been fighting it. Uh, but in January, they were found by the Ninth Circuit to officially have standing which was the big hurdle and they didn't know how that was going to go and so the actual trial begins on october 29th wow. this year well i mean it's it's one of those things that i mean we should have been thinking about for a long time but having a kid brings it into sharp relief that we every generation has left the world a little worse than the one that came before in, in some ways and yeah, in some yeah, ways in better some, exactly exactly and, and it's becoming apparent that the cost is is coming to bear on some of those choices that our our forebears have made and, yeah and we'd better get our shit together i totally yeah. or else soylent green and <laughs> i mean really Indeed. have you watched that lately have you watched that no. in the last two, couple of decades no it's it's terrifyingly prescient except for the eating people bit Oh, oh, I mean, we might okay. get there too. Who knows? But um, uh, uh, so yeah, we got a lot of work to do to get ready for New York Comic Con to ship because I've got, I've been the costume that I'm making, uh, involves I think five. Let's see, one, two, three, four, four separate vendors that I've commissioned pieces and parts from, including for, people that. Or that are professionals and also people we just know and, and, and exactly, become friends with. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And so all of those pieces and parts are coming together here in the cave tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. So Hope it all fits. Yeah. No, it's all definitely going to fit. It's just it's making sure that we're, I'm buttoned down on all the stick things. Uh, you know, there's a, a ton of tiny details that, of course, I want to dial in right. and get right. So. Uh, it's it's funny because like while you're I don't want to without saying what the costume is while you're working on one part of it and waiting for another part, it's like you have 
you're just spending more time on that one part, on that one, one when when you're waiting for. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. So so I think I have what three, I have two days this week and three days next week to wrap it all up. Oh my gosh. No, that that's plenty of time. That's okay. absolutely plenty of time. If uh if oh no, six vendors, right? If uh, uh <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> so the yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me and I don't want to say what it is cuz I don't want to give it away, but I remember when we first started working with you in 2012, we talked about how you feel about 3D printing. Mm-hmm. And you had some really specific thoughts about how 3D printing was inadequate for a lot of the work that you were doing at the time. And it, and it wasn't a natural fit for the long time because I I like making things. Yeah. And, I, you know, we've talked about this before. When I got to ILM, I loved the laser cutter. The laser cutter and I, we got so close that Tori Belecce used to sing, there he goes, laser boy, as I walked <laughs> down the hallways in the late 90s. Mm-hmm. Um all that being said, uh, I have started to incorporate 3D printing into my process. And, it, I, you know, the first one was Sean Charlesworth building the, the mm-hmm. Mill and Ball Motivator for my Hellboy Mecha hand. Uh, and ever since, there's been uh, certain types of highly complicated parts in which uh, the collaborators I've, reached, collaborators I've reached out to have delivered just incredible uh, expansion of what's possible to, to make out of this shop. It, there really is a, a transformation for the 3D printed part. The moment that filler goes on there and it's sanded, it looks machined or injection molded. Yeah. Like the the, the very distinct look of a, of a 3D printed part with all those print lines from that to once the primer goes on, the filler goes on, the bondo goes on, and then... It just well, you, it's you magic. Learn, as a as a prop maker, and you're make, when you're when you're building stuff, you learn you learn these techniques that are all fall under the category of called what I call hiding crimes. So if you have a uh, a surface, let's say you have a prop gun like this, and you have a surface on it that you've sculpted, so it's not quite perfect. You're under the gun, you don't have enough time, so you can't sit there and make it perfectly smooth. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? You machine an aluminum disc which has got some, you know, detail on it and you glue it to that surface. And then your eye looks at that and says, that is a perfect surface because it sees a perfect thing that's shiny on it. And to a certain extent, while in the beginning I thought of 3D prints as incredibly rough because of the filament Mm -hmm. layers and stuff like that, the fact is, is that they're bilaterally perfectly symmetrical if that's what you want, if that's what your drawing is. It makes your eye see this thing as, as much more perfect than it feels like it will be when you first handle one of those rough prints. You get precision. You, yeah. You, you, symmetry, you get So I, I've been showing lines. pictures to people of the stuff on my workbench, which will be it's, the New York Comic Con costume. Sounding, yeah. And they're like, that's not 3D printed. And yeah. it's like, no, it is. We One of my techniques for priming stuff is uh, I take a can of filler primer. Uh, I'm always trying different new types of filler primers. This is They have high amounts of particulate in them, so they go into the small valleys yeah. of the filament. So I will, at the end of a day, unload an entire can of filler primer onto a prop. And then the next morning, it's sandable. It needs that much time to flash off and to dry. And then I'll do the same thing for two days, where then, I've spent relatively little time sanding, a lot of time adding filler. Do you sand until you see the ridges? Is that the kind not of goal? Not necessarily. I sand until it feels smooth. Okay. And I sand until, until happy. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was going to say, I wondered how much of, I, I was curious how much of the change is, is in your head and your approach and how much the because the technology of 3D printing has also advanced dramatically in the last five or six years. It has. Um, no, it's mostly in my thinking about what, what I want to try and build out of here. Okay. And, and, you know, obviously I'm obsessed with the spacesuit, so I'm starting to think about ways in which 3D printing can help me make spacesuits, uh, at least make master parts for spacesuits, for instance. Well, I guess you've also had more time to kind of think about it and figure out new approaches over the last few years than you did while you were shooting Mythbusters. Well, and full-time. I have this great resource of phenomenal 3D printer, laser cutter, etc. Et cetera, makerspace uh, at Tested, mm-hmm. uh, and all this expertise of our of our collaborators like Sean and Mel and uh, 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 Daryl Maloney, uh, and you know soon Melissa Eng. It's 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 a great education in new ways of thinking about building objects. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? That's... I, so I you know I wanted to mention I watched a movie in the hotel this week. Okay. Uh, I watched <laughs> I watched the this Elisa Vikander Tomb Raider. Oh. Is that the one that just came out? Uh-huh. How it's was not it? good. It's, no, it's fine. Here's what it is. It's in, It's cotton candy. If you tried to wash it in a river, it would disappear. 
It it survives yeah. no it survives the, the plot is ludicrous it doesn't make a lot of sense it's shot just like a video game it's shot like a set of video game cutscenes right it's kind yeah, of yeah, loosely no, yes, based yes. on the new Tomb Raider yes. trilogy yeah. right yeah, it's no, how it's, she it's, becomes it's it completely that including long slow-mo shots running over bridges as they're collapsing and stuff but the I, father I, McNulty from The Wire yeah. just hams it up Dominic wow. Monaghan uh, he, some, Dominic something yes yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, terrific but I, I just found it very enjoyable I normally get mad about bad dumb plot stuff uh, and that movie I just found regularly <laughs> enjoyable <laughs> Adam let me through. let me recommend uh, you watch uh, Michael Fassbender's uh, Assassin's Creed film though. I oh tried to watch that I tried oh, to no, watch no, it no, I got about 15 minutes in and or it Jake Gyllenhaal Prince, of, Prince, of, Prince Persia. of Persia oh, that one that that uh, yeah. oh. Assassin's Creed took itself so seriously That's, so, Assassin's Creed does take itself very seriously Adam <laughs> but I, the the the, the, the the Tomb Raider movie, I like I said, I found it more enjoyable than I expected. Did we? Mm. Did we I don't know if we talked about this, but the new Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> There's a damning by faint praise. Mm. More mm-hmm. enjoyable than I expected. Mm-hmm. Adam Savage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the the two, the Assassin's Creed game that came out last fall did something that they've never done before because you know they build these incredibly massive ornate recreations of historical places right, like right, Rome right. or like the Medici or, Palace. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. 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 And they actually had a mode that you could flip on to just go explore the world and not have to play the game. <gasps> That's all I people. want. That's all I wanted of any game. Yeah. No, no, I know. I know. That's what you're looking for. R- yeah. Um, I I hope that, like... What play, do I have to buy to enjoy that? Just buy the normal game and you can do right, that. Right, but on what we, platform? We, we can, we can, yeah, we'll we can set, set, it. <laughs> um, set it up. But, like, playing open world games like that, like the new Spider-Man game that's set in Manhattan in, like, the... It seems like the MCU Manhattan, maybe? Mm-hmm. Uh, it has Stark oh, Tower. Okay. Yeah. It has the Wakanda Embassy. It's its own thing. Okay, it's its own thing, but it has uh, anyway. Like, his own thing. Like my my <laughs> the point is, my daughter has been swinging around in this fake 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 Manhattan. Yeah, and she's like, Dad, I need to go to Central Park. Can you help me get there? And I'm like, Oh, oh that's that's good. the greatest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, it's like it's like like she doesn't she doesn't want to ever fight people. She doesn't yeah. want to do any of no, that. No, I stuff. don't either. She yeah. just wants to swing. Yeah, she wants to be Spider Man. She's a lover, not a without fighter. the punching. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, we've been doing a lot of movies because we're trying to binge all like make use of. Theater, being able to go to the theater before uh, a baby comes. Before baby comes. So, uh, in the past three weeks, I've seen The Predator. How, How was that? that? Uh, six, six out of ten. Six out of ten. Is it, it's a comedy. No, I was told it was a comedy. Uh, there, they try to be funny. And Shane Black writes yeah. really funny. Yeah, and you have very Shane Black jokes in here, and the. There are two Predators. The first Predator looks really great. The second Predator doesn't look so, good. So apparently, they rewrote the last third of the movie because of test screenings oh my god Um, i have questions (laughs) about the predator (laughs) just in general sure do you like how does a society of people whose entire goal (laughs) is to rip skulls and spines off of people work are they like predator barbers and predator chefs (laughs) is there like a predator you're asking too many questions are these guys are the guys that we see in the predator movies just like the 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 Predator franchise has my I, my favorite tagline in movie history, which is Predator 2, which takes place in the city oh, yeah. with Danny Glover. And the tagline is, he's in town with a few days to kill. Oh. It's so good. It's so good. That's really good. But, but yeah, like... Like, are these the Civil War reenactors of the Predator world that we see? Are they going out and <laughs> living the way things used to be? Like, But, like, Steve in accounting is like, man, look, look, Shane, I don't want to see your... I, I think you actually... Predator is the alt-right of the Predator Right, planet. that's my question. <laughs> the, the joke you're making is actually the reason these Predator movies don't feel great, because the first film, it was shrouded in mystery. Like, the reason the Predator is invisible isn't just because it's a cool effect. It's because... They never want to show you what this monster looks like. Yeah. And the shock of the monster at the end, an amazing Oh, it's such a great design. I mean, that, that, in the first movie, when that happens, you're so... It's yeah. just one of the coolest aliens ever. Well, mm-hmm. it, took, it took the good lesson of Jaws and applied it exceptionally well, which is... Oh, my is, God. Do you, yeah. do you know how they did that invisibility effect? You told me the other day, and our, I was blown our, away. Our, it was that, that, those effects, the, the invisibility effects specifically, were done by a company called R. Greenberg Associates out of New York, a really high-end... Uh, a, a special effects shop uh, in the 80s. You can read all about them in all sorts of different issues of Cinefix. So th- if you remember, the effect had this kind of lensing like from the stepped. outer yeah. steps. And, and the so they had the actor wear a red Predator suit for high contrast to the green forest behind him. And then they optically printed each layer and rotoscoped in each of those layers by hand. It was so painstakingly meticulous. This is the kind of thing you could build a filter for now and just do yeah, right. like but back seconds. then it was insanely intensive 
Wow. Yeah. And so beautiful. And uh, some of the guys who worked on that ended up later on building the bullet time cameras for John Gaeta for oh, wow. the Matrix, Matrix films. I really, the, the effect that I've seen from the early 80s lately that I really want to find out how people did, and I, I've got to borrow your cine effects to find out, mm -hmm. is that shield in Dune when they're knife fighting. Oh, yeah, the, like the, the, the boxy, slow shield, the boxy shield. It's really beautiful. Oh, it's un, like, I had never watched that movie in HD before, and watching like a 1080p Blu ray version of yeah. that. I was just stunned at how clear, like yeah. it didn't look that clear when I saw it on VHS. Um, um, and it's, it's so, exceptional. Yeah, we should figure out which which issue it's in because I've got a complete set yeah, of yeah, sound yeah. effects. Next time over your house. Oh, it's also oh. on an iPad. You can get the iPad oh, app and go look it up. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, so Predator, six out, the Predator, six, six out of 10. Out of 10. Uh, a Simple Favor. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's the... Solid eight out of 10. That's the Paul, Paul Feig, Feig film? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Who's in that? It's um, Anna Kendrick, Blake Lively. Yeah. Solid 8 out of 10. Uh, searching, I think I recommended this before. 9 out of 10. Love searching. It. What's Searching? John Cho. Uh, oh. It's a uh, screen capture film. So uh, the entire film is told through the, the uh, computer screen. Hmm. What you're looking at in the theater. It's kind of Amer that's a, an American Vandal thing, too, kind of. Uh, like, there's some shots, but it's a lot yeah, of it's yeah, told yeah, through. Uh, like, what is American Vandal? I oh. keep hearing about this. Uh, it's a Netflix original <laughs> series, now in season two, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a parody of some kind. It's a, yeah, it's a okay. riff on um, true crime serialized um, it's a, documentaries. It's a, oh, wow. it's a no winks, no nods mockumentary about like Manhunter and Serial and those oh, kinds wow. of but things. But set in a high school. Yes, yeah, it's like, imagine. Yeah. Look, the the here's the here's here's your here's your incredibly yeah. derivative breakdown. It's brick meets S Town. Oh, nice! Yeah. I'm, that sounds okay. Awesome. That's that's good. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I've also been listening to, uh, in addition to going to my happy place with Roman Mars on ninety nine percent invisible. Yes. I'm listening to another Radiotopia podcast called Criminal by mm. Phoebe Judge. Um, it's great to say her name because each episode begins with her going, "I'm I'm Phoebe Judge." And this is criminal. And she says it the same way every single time. It's important. And it's always like she goes into weird. So it's always something about somebody who's committed a crime. So one, it's the guy who's streaked at more sporting events than any other human in history. Wow. Uh, another, it's like the greatest defense. This most recent episode is the greatest defense lawyer in history. Uh, another one is a family that was on the run for 30 years and how that what toll that took. Wow. On. Oh, it's it's fantastic. It's a really does good it, podcast. Have, so the thing that I like about American Vandal, I mean, in addition to it being clever and funny and 30 minute episodes, so I'll actually watch it, mm -hmm. is that it it they really looked at the the tropes of that format. Of right, that, right, right. That style of show. And they've broken them down and skewer them very i would say pretty subtly a lot of times like i don't yeah. watch a lot of those true crime shows um but it, it's it's it, like it's it was very interesting it's very nice. well done nice yeah i i i i will check it out i'm we're still it's a very quick watch still crawling yeah. our way through the americans you'll you'll look when you need a breather from the Americans, when it gets too intense, which is every single day, flip one of these on and you'll watch like six of them. And then oh, you'll be like, oh, there's only two until the end of the season. I should just nice. stamp them to four okay. and watch them. All right. We'll check them out tonight. Yeah, highly recommended. Yeah. Anything All on right. the site this week? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. Uh, this week we have a video with um, the Star Child. Oh, yes. oh boy. <laughs> so um, if, you're been if you've been curious about the Star Child project, Adam, you that and people have been seeing yes, and noting in the background of the on, shop. You'll finally be able to hear the full story about that. Was, it, was this been a one day build, or are you just have you just given up the lie that this is always one day? No, 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 no. Star Child, uh, we didn't call it a one day build. No, 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 it was no, more no, like no, a check in. Yeah. Jer yeah. Jeremy Williams helped me with some electronics in the yeah. Star Child uh, that Steve Neal sculpted. Yeah. It's been in the background of my shop for ages. I finally got the eyes, the correct eyes for it, and well, you'll see in the video what I did with it. Can them. it wink? Is it like a is it, it like a rock, <laughs> rock rock wink? I'm gonna ask like... for the one thing it can't do. It oh. can't do that. Damn. <laughs> All right, and then I, mean, I guess that's cool though. <laughs> one more, one more podcast till New York. So yeah. we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us this week. And once again, I want to thank the sponsor that made this episode of Still Entitled possible, and that's KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates super cool, hands-on projects for kids that make learning about science, technology, engineering, art, and math (STEAM) fun. Kids can create their own arcade games, construct a hydraulic claw, or tinker with electronics and motors. KiwiCo is offering Still Entitled listeners the chance to try these projects for free. To redeem this offer and learn more about their projects for kids, visit kiwico.com untitled.